Hello everybody. Before I get started with my presentation, I just wanted to talk about a couple exciting events happening in the start of 2018. First, we have Yuri Nowitzki uh, is hosting another Abwall Summit this year at Big Sky, Montana. It's sure to be a weekend pack with a lot of fun, excitement, and good hernia education. And then, of course, there's the 2018 International Hernia Congress organized this year by Gina Adralis and Salvador Morales Condi. This will be in Miami in March, which is an exciting time for all of us to head down to Florida another jam-packed conference with folks from all over the world. So I encourage you guys to register for these exciting events. Let's get started with the talk. Hello everyone in the IT community. For those that don't know me, my name is Sean Ornstein. I'm at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. I want to give a special thanks to the International Hernia Collaboration as well as to Omar Ghanem who's been uh, the ringleader in organizing these wonderful CME projects. So thank you to him and to the rest of, uh, uh, of everyone in IHC. Here's my disclosure slide. I'll be talking about several things with regards to doing TARS uh, with the big focus on doing open TARS. There will be later, later talks doing minimally invasive transversus abdominis release. I definitely want to spend some time uh, discussing some anatomical considerations as well as some indications as well as technique. When it comes to performing ab wall reconstruction, there's a lot of things that go into making sure that your patient has the best outcomes. Things like uh, pre-op optimization, doing the right procedure and operation, which is what I'm going to be focusing on my talk. Other things like uh, the right time of the procedure, right mesh products, are all important aspects. Again, for this talk, I'm going to be focusing more on techniques, specifically open tar. And we can't have a good discussion about abdominal wall reconstruction without first talking about some uh, classic repairs such as retrorectus repair. You know, Reeves and Stopa developed this technique, originally started off as for bilateral inguinal hernias, and then later develop this for more ventral hernias. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful procedure that can provide a lot of benefit for patients. And I absolutely love Dr. Stopa's quote about giant prosthetic reinforcement of the visceral sac because when you actually look at a transversus abdominis release and the wide overlap, I think you truly do get and achieve his, uh, his vision of giant prosthetic reinforcement of the visceral sac. And I still perform plenty of Reeves Stopa retrorectus repairs. Uh, it's got great results, low recurrence rate, and a lot of people consider this the gold standard for open ventral hernia repair. In my practice, I use retrorectus for medium to large defects. But what if retrorectus isn't enough for your complex hernia or patient? There are several areas where hernias can be too challenging for a retrorectus only repair. Uh, it's quite simply, if it's just the defect is too large to be uh, uh, accommodated by a straight up retrorectus repair. How about a large peristomal defect or one that's out more toward the side, toward the linea semilunaris? Even things like uh, flank hernias in, a, in conjunction with the midline hernia that uh, you need to reinforce not only the lateral flank but also the center of the abdomen. Other things like sub xiphoid defects which can, which can be very hard to fix in a retrorectus uh, because that plane stops at the xiphoid process and you won't be able to get su sufficient overlap superiorly. Uh, uh, additionally, things like uh, suprapubic defects, which uh, small to medium ones are certainly amenable to retrorectus repair, but larger suprapubic or ones that have uh, challenging tissue, such as uh, after previous prostatectomy or radiation, uh, these can be aided with the use of, uh, of doing tar. There are several techniques that have been described to gain space beyond the edge of the rectus. Uh, things like preperitoneal technique, this is a technique that's popularized by Dr. Henniford. Um, that Yernovitsky wrote about while he was a fellow there. However, the preperitoneal technique is not a myofascial advancement, but more of a dissection of a plane amenable to a large piece of mesh. Um, other techniques like the intramuscular technique written by uh, Alfie Carbonell. With the intramuscular technique, the plane is divided in between the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis uh, muscle. Uh, the biggest drawback to this technique is that uh, this sacrifices all the neurovascular bundles as you enter laterally into this plane. And of course there's transversus abdominis muscle release which is what I will be focusing on in my talk today. Interestingly when TAR was first introduced uh, it was discussed in Berlin in 2009 and it was actually met with some skepticism. The first paper of 42 patients demonstrated the technique as well as the benefits of TAR uh, which was published a few years later. Essentially, this is an ex tar is an extension of the retrorectus space. It allows closure of larger complex ventral hernias, 
and it really is an extra large plane uh, for the use of uncoated mesh. And again, as I stated before, this truly, I think, epitomizes giant prosthetic reinforcement of visceral sac as initially described by Rene Stopa. So when do I use TAR? Uh, TAR is my go-to procedure for larger complex ventral hernias. But other more atypical hernias, things like subxiphoid hernias, someone's had a previous sternotomy with non-healing or non-union of their sternum, uh, other things like peristomal hernias, flank hernias, especially if there's a midline component, suprapubic hernias as described, as well as a wide variety of large and or complex ventral hernias. So let's dive into some technique. Step one would be a generous laparotomy uh, and complete adhesial lysis. Now, um, I would recommend saving at least a two to three centimeters of fascia just below the xiphoid as well as just above the pubic bone. And this is in order to do some transfascial fixation in the midline. If you do go up too high above the xiphoid, that just means instead of a midline transfascial fixation point, you have to put the two, one on either side of the midline. Now, extra peritoneal techniques have been described with this paper being by Scott Roth and his team, which allows you to stay out of the abdominal cavity and stay just uh, above the peritoneal uh, level. However, um, in my hands, um, I do feel that a complete anterior abdominal wall adhesial lysis is uh, really important to prevent the, the risk of bowel injury, especially as you get laterally with your dissection in the tar plane, which can be much thinner than in the retrorectus plane. The next step begins with a standard retrorectus dissection. You identify the edge of, uh, of your hernia sac and rectus junction, and then you incise the posterior rectus sheath about a half a centimeter to a centimeter from that edge, and you're going to extend that superiorly and inferiorly, and then you're going to complete some lateral dissection. A real important tip is that before you extend your dissection superiorly and inferiorly too much, you need to ensure that you're in the true retrorectus space. The reason why I bring this up is that sometimes you'd start your dissection and you may end not end up in the retroactive space uh, because of the distortion of those tissues from the hernia sac. That is, if you're too far medial, you may end up dissecting and end into a subcutaneous fat. Now, you haven't burned any bridges with this maneuver, uh, but just recognize that if you don't see that, uh, that retroactive muscle or some contraction of the muscle, Recognize you're in the wrong plane and continue your dissection a little bit more laterally until you achieve that retromuscular space. Another important thing to uh, ensure is that you do not uh, dissect too much under the belly of the rectus muscle. Uh, as you dissect superiorly, there is a tendency to get off of the, that half centimeter, centimeter off the edge and start, start to dissect under the middle of the belly of the rectus muscle. And if you do that, you're going to lose out on a lot of posterior rectus sheath. So as you start to do your dissection superiorly as well as inferiorly, uh, just make sure you're staying just off of the edge of midline. Next, you want to clean off all the fibrofatty tissue from the posterior rectus sheath just by simply sweeping this out laterally. Sometimes there's some small little uh, vessels they need to take out with cautery. And you want to clean this up enough to reach the linea semilunaris, and this is recognized by looking at the neurovascular bundles which in, uh, insert at this level. Uh, this picture shows a nice thick uh, posterior rectus sheath, underbelly of the rectus muscle, uh, retracted uh, laterally, as well as a few good neurovascular bundles, which helps identify a key anatomic structure, namely the linea semilunaris. At this point, I can't emphasize enough that it is crucial that you identify the neurovascular bundles at the linea semilunaris, because this is an important anatomic landmark for you to continue on your tar dissection to really ensure that you are medial to the linea semilunaris. If we focus on the edge of the rectus muscle at the trimuscular complex where the uh, obliques and the transversus abdominis meet up at the linea semilunaris, we see a couple interesting findings. And what we see is that the uh, neurovascular bundles come out between the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis, but what we focus on with tar dissection is that site just medial to that. When you incise the posterior lamella, you leave the neurovascular bundles in place without disruption. So if we look at the bottom part of the screen, that proper dissection location, again, we're medial to the uh, neurovascular bundles. This allows the advancement and still spares the neurovascular bundles as well as the junction lateral to that. However, if you dissect lateral to these neurovascular bundles, you may end up uh, compromising and or destabilizing the lateral abdominal wall. And the reason why this can happen 
is if you cut lateral, you can end up not only dissecting that posterior lamella, but you can end up cutting your both your external and your internal obliques, which again can totally destabilize the linus and the linaris. And we've certainly seen our uh, fair share of, of uh, new lateral wall uh, semilunar line ventral hernias. Also, excessive retraction of the rectus muscle laterally can uh, lead to sliding the muscle off of the anterior rectus sheath, which can disrupt the orientation. You may not realize uh, where the true semilunar, semilunar line is, and you may end up dissecting too far laterally. Another aspect of the anatomy of the abdominal wall that makes TAR feasible is the actual location of the transversus abdominis muscle itself. Uh, you know, the classic Frank Netter drawing shows all three of the lateral muscles all lined up with the obliques and the transversus all lined up in sort of one happy little end. But the reality is that this is only for part of the abdominal wall. Superiorly, the transversus abdominis muscle actually goes posterior to the rectus muscle. Uh, this anatomic consideration is what allows us to uh, properly identify the transversus abdominis muscle and plane for division in a tar. What I like about this slide is it shows the location of the transversus abdominis muscle and its aponeurosis at different levels of the abdomen. Superiorly, as I said before, uh, the, the transversus abdominis muscle is underneath or posterior to the belly of the rectus muscle. As you get out toward the mid-abdomen, now that's where you get the confluence of the two obliques and the transversus abdominis, like that Frank Nader drawing. But as you move inferiorly, you're, not, you're no longer dissecting any muscular component of the transversus abdominis, and instead you're just dissecting uh, the aponeurotic part, which is more in the lower aspect of your tar division. To continue on with the tar dissection and repair, um, you're going to complete your retrorectus uh, dissection. And then again, you're going to identify your uh, linea semilunaris, and you're going to start your division line about half a centimeter to one centimeter medial to the linea semilunaris. This slide shows uh, where you want to dissect, which is that green line, medial to the semilunar line, versus that red line, which is lateral. Uh, now, I don't know if you can notice or see from your screens, but that green line isn't perfectly straight line. As you can see, it's a little curved around the nerve vascular bundles, and that's okay. This doesn't have to be a perfectly straight line. The line itself will more or less straighten itself out. So uh, take the time to dissect around those nerve vascular bundles so you can preserve them uh, during your dissection. While variations of tar dissection have been described since its inception, I do think a top-down approach provides the best anatomic landmarks and I think the easiest to understand, especially for those that are just starting to perform tars. So in the upper aspect, you've already done your retrorectus, you've identified your landmarks, you're going to pick a spot half a centimeter to a centimeter medial to the linea semilunaris, and then you're going to start your dissection. You first divide that posterior lamella of the internal oblique. That's going to expose transversus abdominis muscle fibers. The next step is to divide all the exposed muscle fibers all the way down to the transversalis fascia. This video demonstrates one side dissection of transversus abdominis muscle release. As you can see here, we're starting to divide only the posterior lamella at this point. We have not begun uh, to divide any of the muscular components. This video demonstrates one way of doing this where you start by dividing as far as you can go down uh, just the initial aponeurotic part of the posterior lamella and then uh, come back and get the muscle. Another method of doing this is to stepwise do uh, the posterior lamella division and the underlying muscle fibers and then keep working your way down inferiorly going all the way down to transversalis fascia uh, as, you, uh, as you proceed from superior to inferior dissection. Any muscular oozing can be stopped with some light cautery and if you do end up missing any muscle fibers along your path of dissection you do need to go back and get those fibers because if you don't as you start to lateralize that tar plane those muscle fibers will continue to stretch and stretch, and at some point you will need to take them. During the last part of this dissection, we're in the inferior third or so, and we're dividing only the aponeurotic part of the uh, transversus abdominis, we're done with all the muscular division. 
To start the lateralization of this plane, typically get some peanuts or kittners and gently sweep that muscle out and out laterally. Uh, key important parts of this are to ensure that you try and keep the transversalis fascia down with the peritoneum. After elevating the muscle off of the transversalis fascia, I like to just get my hands back there, do some gentle finger flicking and massaging of that plane, which can break up this avascular plane relatively easy, and carry that dissection all the way out laterally until you reach the retroperitoneal fat. Once you've completed your bilateral tar dissection, then you want to proceed with your inferior and superior dissection. When starting with your inferior dissection, you'll bring one hand uh, down each side of your retromuscular plane down toward the pubis. And I'll typically take a finger and sweep it along Cooper's to the contralateral side, taking care not to disrupt any of corona mortis or other bridging vessels in that area. Once I've uh, gone across the midline, I'll drop my hand and fingers down, and then I'll simply just bovi across uh, toward the uh, the top of that dissection plane, but just underneath, or I should say deep, to the anterior rectus sheath. This will connect both sides bilaterally and will typically leave you with a nice flap of tissue in your uh, suprapubic space. Be mindful that below the arcuate line, the tissue is much thinner, therefore it can tear easier, though there tends to be a little bit more redundancy of tissues uh, in this area. Superior dissection can be a little trickier than inferior dissection. And the reason this is because as you proceed superiorly toward the xiphoid process, uh, you can commonly run into fibers of the diaphragm. And you can generally note these by the uh, uh, vertical orientation of the fibers compared to the transverse uh, fiber orientation of the transverse abdominis. In order to complete dissection of the superior space, typically get a finger within the transverse abdominis plane, uh, one on each side. I will uh, advance those superiorly in that plane gently trying to go underneath or just deep to the xiphoid process. And just like the inferior dissection, I try to break across the midline till I reach the contralateral side. Once I have a finger uh, across the midline, I will drop my hand and that finger down posteriorly, and I will uh, cauterize just underneath the xiphoid process. This maneuver will release the transversus abdominis from its posterior attachments under the xiphoid process, typically leaving the uh, retroxiphoid fat pad. Um, again, it's really important to watch out for those diaphragm fibers. If you get too much of those uh, diaphragm fibers, you could end up with an iatrogenic morgagni hernia. Also, be careful with your dissection underneath the costal margin. The transversus abdominis inserts itself posterior to the ribs, which gives you nice exposure under the ribs. However, because of the way it inserts, it can be under a little tension, and because of that amount of tension, that can lead to more tearing of that area, and those rents can be somewhat challenging to uh, repair. When all the tar dissection is complete, uh, you remove your countable cowboy towel and do a final inspection of the abdomen. This is followed by closure of the posterior fascial layer, typically with a 2-0 slowly resorbable suture, and then it's on to mesh placement. For mesh placement, my go-to mesh is typically a 30 by 30 centimeter soft polypropylene mesh in a diamond formation. If you take a 30 by 30 mesh, rotate as a diamond, you get about 42 centimeters from long point to long point. This is sufficient for most central defects. However, for larger defects, or atypical hernias and the sub xiphoid or suprapubic space, I'll do a home plate where I'll get two overlapping pieces of 30 by 30 mesh with a diamond pulled more inferiorly down uh, and then a squared mesh in the superior aspect. With a nice tar dissection, that creates a wide space uh, for that mesh, that square edge, the top edge of that square part of the home plate to go underneath the xiphoid and underneath the costal margin bilaterally. Mesh fixation is a bit controversial now. Uh, typically, I do like to place a round of uh, transfascial sutures to fixate my mesh, usually one superiorly, one inferiorly, and then two or three at the lateral uh, aspects. If I do a home plate, sometimes I'll take a small little uh, piece of proline and fix the meshes together just to prevent them from sliding around. Some surgeons are using fewer and fewer transabdominal fixation and some even no fixation However, in my opinion, I do like uh, the idea 
of placing transfascial fixation to offload the tension of my closure and put that uh, onto the mesh itself. Just to throw in a quick word about retrorectus mesh placement, I do it in a similar fashion, uh, and I do fixate this with one uh, superior and inferior fixation as well as two, three uh, fixation points on the side. And again, like the like with the tar, but especially with the retrorectus, I like the transabdominal fixation to offload the tension of my closure and put that uh, tension onto the mesh itself. There's been some videos that have shown uh, uh, retromuscular and specifically retrorectus repairs with disruption of that posterior sheath. And um, I, I do believe that by placing some of these transabdominal fixation points, I think you can decrease the chance of a posterior or even an anterior fascial uh, dehiscence by, again, by offloading that midline closure tension. I commonly place two 19 French Blake drains for a tar or a single Blake drain for a retrorectus repair. Um, and then I will close the anterior fascia with a number one slowly re resorbable suture. And then followed by the skin in multiple layers. The big thing is you really want to ensure soft tissue coverage over your fascia. Some common questions that come up during tar are the following. Uh, the, the most simple one is what if you make some holes in the posterior fascia? And this is quite common and usually not a big deal. Typically, simple little rents are closed with 2-0 resorbable sutures. Uh, if it's a larger rent, then, um, then I'll maybe run part of it, but typically it's just some interrupted. Now, what if you can't close your posterior fascia? Uh, perhaps it's a redo retrorectus, or perhaps you had to remove some old mesh and that destroyed your posterior fascia. Uh, there are several options for this. One is if you have some thick uh, hernia sac, you can use some of that to reconstruct your posterior layer. You can use a piece of Vicro mesh, or you can use a thin biologic mesh to bridge this layer. Now, this posterior layer is not a strength layer, it's more of a barrier between your viscera and the, uh, the retromuscular mesh, which is your uh, load-bearing uh, strength layer. Well, what if you can't close your anterior fascia, or if there seems like there's a lot of tension on your closure? And before you place your mesh, it's a good idea to get some coker clamps on that anterior fascia and try to reapproximate to midline to see how much uh, force you have to use to pull it to, together to get it closed. If I find that I'm having a hard time getting my anterior fascia closed, first thing I'll do is use a heavyweight polypropylene mesh. So in the few instances that I will use a heavyweight Marlex type of mesh. Now let's say you've placed your mesh and you're still you're, you're unable to close uh, that anterior fascia. Instead of running over the, with a number one suture uh, from the ends, I will instead place uh, multiple figure of eight sutures using a number one Maxon or PDS suture, and then sequentially tie those from the ends and in the middle. Now, if there are some small areas that you're still unable to get the anterior fascia closed despite placing a bunch of figure of eights, uh, and you're forced to bridge that small segment, the most important thing at that point is to ensure you have soft tissue coverage over that mesh. Uh, so in that point, uh, I'll typically close the fatty and subcutaneous layers and multiple layers on top. Uh, if it's a larger, larger defect, hopefully you've prepared for this ahead of time and have your plastic surgery colleagues to come in and do some type of flap coverage. Another couple questions that come up are about doing anterior and posterior component separation. That is doing tar and external oblique release. But the first question being, can you do those at the same time? And I would strongly discourage anybody doing both an anterior and a posterior component separation at the same time. The reason is because you only have three lateral muscles. If you cut two of those three, you have a good chance of destabilizing that lateral abdominal wall. Therefore, uh, I would pick whichever one you're most comfortable with it, whether it be an external oblique release or a, a transversus abdominis release. And uh, whichever you're most comfortable with, then go with that technique. Now, what if somebody's had a remote history of external oblique release, say, several years ago? Can you do a TAR after that? I would answer, I would answer that question, yes. However, uh, I would use, do it with caution and select hands, and they have to be well healed from that. And I'm talking a year or so out from that external oblique release. Uh, you know, a great paper written by Eric Pauli, uh, he was at Case Western with Nowitzki and Rosen, studied this, and um, it still was very, very challenging surgery with pretty significant amount of SSO and um, you know a reasonable recurrence rate but that study only went to 11 months so again I would use a lot of caution if you're going to do uh, a TAR after a remote external oblique release.
So let's see, how does tar stack up? Well, by looking at uh, some published data that we put out last year, looking at the largest tar database in the world, over 400 patients with almost 350 with at least one year follow-up. A uh, big range of uh, complex hernias there listed as well. And if we take a look at the outcomes of this large cohort of patients, uh, we see uh, an 18% surgical site event rate with a 9% surgical site infection rate. I want to bring your attention to that bottom arrow in that second uh, table at the bottom. Out of, uh, uh, despite having a small handful of surgical site infections, not a single mesh had to be explanted. There's only a small handful of meshes that required some partial debridement, but not a single mesh had to be completely removed. And then if we look at a recurrence rate, again with almost 30, 350 at one year follow-up, with over 30 months of uh, mean follow-up, only a 3.7% hernia a recurrence rate uh, using synthetic mesh and transversus abdominis muscle release. And of those recurrences, five of them were due to central mesh failure. And we've written separately about that and the concern for monofilament polyester uh, as a, a risk factor for central mesh failure. So where do we go from here? Well, you know, I, I love this slide in that when I made this slide a few years ago, it, I titled it as the future of MIS ventral hernia repair. But I had to, had to change that because that's not the future. That's what we're doing now. And thanks to uh, people like Igor Beliansky and, and Conrad Balliser who have really blazed the trail with regards to complex robotic and laparoscopic uh, ventral hernia repair. I'm looking forward to their upcoming IHC talks as well as the work that they and so many others on IHC are doing to not only promote complex ventral hernia repair but to push the bar even higher and higher and, uh, and these ever-evolving techniques that some exciting stuff coming down the pipeline. So in conclusion, I, I believe that TAR is advantageous for a wide variety of large and complex abdominal wall hernias. It really is true giant prosthetic reinforcement of the visceral sac. It's got a low rate of surgical site occurrence and event as well as low rate of hernia recurrence itself. And for those that are really embarking on complex abdominal wall reconstruction, it really is an essential option in the armamentarium of hernia surgeons. That said, long-term outcomes, you know, five, ten years plus, is still pending. I will throw out a word of caution. Um, I do think there is an overuse of tar. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I love doing tar for most of my complex repairs, but tar may, may not be necessary for small uh, or less challenging defects. Uh, there's also, it can be challenging anatomy. So I would encourage anybody that does plan on uh, embarking on the path of doing tar, I encourage you to uh, explore the abdominal wall more, things like cadaver and animal labs, uh, doing some shadowing and getting a good mentor, whether the mentor that you go to see them or they come and uh, help you while uh, you're in your own OR. I want to thank you for your time. Looking forward to uh, speaking with you all on live uh, Facebook chat tomorrow night for some questions and answers. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys at the next get together at some upcoming conference. And uh, again, don't forget, a couple upcoming conferences, Big Sky, at Yuri's Abwal Summit in February, and the Big International Hernia Congress in March in Miami. See you guys there.